Hello, this is Dr. Grande. Today's question is, can I analyze the case of Helen Wilson and the Beatrice 6? Just a reminder, I'm not diagnosing anybody in this video, only speculating about what could be happening in a situation like this. If you enjoy this video, please like it, subscribe to my channel, and consider supporting me on Patreon. I will put the link to Patreon in the description for this video. First, I'll look at the background in this case. I'll move to the timeline of the crime, then I'll offer my analysis. In 1985, 68-year-old Helen Wilson lived in Beatrice, Nebraska. This is a rural farming town about an hour south of Lincoln, with a population of about 12,000 people. Helen's husband died of a heart attack in the 1960s. At the age of 54, Helen never remarried. She lived alone in an apartment in a three-story brick building at 212 North 6th Street, which had housed the telephone company for many years. In January 1985, Helen took a seven-hour bus ride to visit one of her sons and her grandchildren in western Nebraska. During that trip, she developed a cough, but refused to be treated by a physician. She returned to her apartment in Beatrice on February 3. By February 5, Helen's condition had worsened. Her son Daryl visited with his wife stopping by later that evening. They left at about 9.45 p.m. and called Helen at around midnight to make sure that she had taken her medicine. There was no answer. Sometime in the early morning hours of February 6, a 22-year-old man named Bruce Allen Smith entered Helen's apartment building. He ripped wires from an electrical transformer near the furnace and removed a fuse from the fuse box. Bruce made entry into Helen's apartment and attacked her, he committed an assault of a sexual nature, beat her, and suffocated her with a winter scarf. He dragged her body to the living room floor, where it remained until her sister discovered her body in the morning. The police were notified at 9.29 a.m. Here's what they found during their investigation. The door to Helen's apartment had been forced open. Helen had several broken bones, including her sternum and her arm. She was wearing two rings and a wristwatch. There was about $1,300 in cash in total around the apartment, some of which was in Helen's purse, which was in clear view. One of the knives from Helen's kitchen was found outside the bedroom. Helen had a few defensive cuts on her, but the knife wasn't used to kill her. Half of a $5 bill was found on the floor. Blood, semen, and hairs were recovered from the scene. Later, the lab identified the blood as type B, non-secretor, this was before DNA testing was available. Residents in neighboring apartments had not heard the attack. The police investigated a few possible suspects. One was Bruce Allen Smith. Witnesses said that on the night of the murder, Bruce was at a nearby bar, drinking. He told people that he was highly interested in sex. He complained that he had not had sex in a long time. A woman at the bar invited him to a party at her trailer. When he was there, he tried to attack her. One of her neighbors threw him out of the trailer. A friend of his dropped Bruce off just a few blocks away from Helen's apartment at around 3.45 a.m. He was last seen staggering toward her building. The witness said that Bruce did not have any scratches on his face. However, after the murder, another witness said that Bruce did have scratches on his face. Bruce had an extensive criminal history, which he started accumulating from a young age. His grandmother used to live in the apartment building where Helen lived. The police believed that they had a very good suspect. They were correct. He was actually the killer. The problem was that the state crime lab made an error when testing the blood, one of many that particular lab made over the years. The police excluded Bruce as a suspect because they thought his blood did not match the blood at the crime scene. The case of Helen Wilson went cold. A man named Bert Searcy took an interest in the case. He had worked for the Beatrice Police Department from 1977 to 1982. After this, he bought a 160-acre farm. Bert volunteered to work on the case as a private investigator. The police would not cooperate with him. Therefore, he did not have access to police reports, interview records, crime scene photographs, or anything else that only the police would have access to. Bert interviewed a 17-year-old named Lisa Hodendorf after being directed to by one of her friends. 
Lisa told Bert that she had information about the murder. Lisa claimed that she saw a man named Tom Winslow pull into an alley near Helen's building on the night of the murder. Tom was with a man named Joseph White and a woman named Joanne Taylor. Lisa said that Joanne Taylor told her that she and Joseph White had murdered a woman. Bert thought Lisa was a good witness. He found a job with the Gage County Sheriff's Department and pressured the sheriff into allowing him to work on the Helen Wilson case. So now he was a police officer again. Bert interviewed Tom Winslow. Tom was in jail at the time for an unrelated crime. He initially said that he had been at work during the murder, but now, in jail and desperately wanting to get out, Tom said that he was with Joseph and Joanne on the night of the murder. During the recorded interview with Bert, Tom was having trouble remembering information that was consistent with the crime. Bert shut off the video recording device for 44 minutes and then resumed his interview with Tom. After this, Tom magically remembered seeing Joseph and Joanne walk up the stairs of Helen's apartment building. The police arrested Joseph White, who by this time was in Alabama, and Joanne Taylor, who was in North Carolina. Bert interviewed Joanne. She said that she was with Joseph on the night of the murder when he went to Helen's light-colored house to do yard work. Joanne saw Joseph and another man attack Helen. There are two major problems with this story. Helen lived in a red three-story brick building, not a light-colored house, and on the night of February 5, it was minus 7 degrees outside, a little cold for yard work. Bert turned the recording device off for 19 minutes. When he started it again, Joanne, just like Tom, had a magical memory retrieval. Now she remembered that Helen lived in a red brick building. She also remembered that Joseph had a habit of ripping bills in half, which was significant because half of a $5 bill was found in Helen's apartment, as I mentioned. Joanne later met with a doctoral level mental health professional named Wayne Price, who was also a reserve sheriff. Wayne had treated Joanne in the past and was now interviewing her as a police officer. This was clearly not ethical, but Wayne didn't seem too concerned. Wayne helped Joanne to recover so-called repressed memories, something that many mental health professionals still believe in to this day, despite the fact that there is no evidence to support they are real. After being assisted by Wayne, Joanne magically remembered Tom Winslow was the other man who attacked Helen Wilson. At this point in the story, three people had been arrested for Helen's murder, Joanne Taylor, Joseph White, and Tom Winslow. None of these individuals had type B blood, so the police kept on looking for more perpetrators. They soon found a woman named Deborah Sheldon. She suffered from mental illness and had a low level of intelligence. She implicated herself in the murder and implicated a man named James Dean, like the famous actor who died in 1955. James Dean denied any involvement, but Wayne Price helped him uncover a repressed memory. In addition, he was given a so-called lie detector test. The police claimed that he failed, even though somebody cannot fail or pass that test. It is pseudoscientific nonsense. James started to wonder if maybe he was involved in the crime. After all, his repressed memories and the polygraph results indicated that he was. Instead of being a rebel without a cause, this James Dean was more like a rebel without confidence. James was offered a plea deal and pleaded guilty to aiding and abetting second-degree murder. At this point in the case, five people had been arrested in connection with Helen's murder, but still none of the perpetrators had type B blood. The police fixed this problem by helping James and Deborah to remember yet another conspirator. Her name was Kathy Gonzalez. She lived in the apartment above Helen Wilson. Wayne Price helped her to remember that she was involved and she was also told that she failed a polygraph. She was pressured to confess. Kathy had type B blood, although it was secretor as opposed to non-secretor. This mismatch of the secretor component had led the police to exclude the actual killer as a suspect, but at this point, they weren't worried about that. They were just happy to have anybody with type B. Kathy, Joanne, and Deborah all pleaded guilty to aiding and abetting second-degree murder. 
Joseph White and Tom Winslow maintain their innocence. Joseph's trial started in October 1989. The jury was mortified to hear that Joseph had once appeared in a pornographic movie. In addition, when he was asked if he recognized a photo of Helen Wilson, he held the photograph and said, it's a picture of an old woman. Joseph had never seen Helen before. He did not know who she was. Everyone in the courtroom was shocked that Joseph would refer to a woman who was old as an old woman. They wondered what kind of monster would do this. The jury ignored the fact that the prosecution witnesses were incredibly inconsistent and the case against Joseph was comically weak and disorganized. It only took a few hours for the jury to convict Joseph of first-degree murder. He was sentenced to life in prison. In light of Joseph's conviction, Tom Winslow took a plea deal. He pleaded guilty to second-degree murder and was sentenced to 50 years in prison. So at this point in the narrative, the police managed to put six innocent people in prison and leave the actual killer free. Bruce Allen Smith died of AIDS on September 30, 1992. He would never face charges. Years later, after a motion by Joseph's attorney, over 40 items from the crime scene were sent to be tested for DNA. None of the DNA matched anyone who had been convicted. In 2008, some of the Beatrice Six were already out of prison. The rest were released. Charges against Joseph White were dismissed. The other five falsely convicted people were given pardons. The six individuals filed a lawsuit and won $28.1 million. Joseph White died on March 27, 2011, at the age of 48, after being crushed by a machine in a coal plant in Alabama where he was working. This was just a few days before $475,000 was paid to his estate. Now moving to my analysis. The injustice in this case was a direct result of the police being incompetent and gullible. This case exemplifies the dangers of not having any critical thinking skills and believing in magic. Here are my thoughts on a few items that stood out to me in this case. Item number one. The police should have never believed the stories they heard from the confidential informant Lisa Podendorf or the suspects in the case. There were just too many inconsistencies. Just a few examples. Lisa claimed that she saw Tom Winslow's car at 10.18 p.m. on February 5, 1985. Based on where she said she was standing, a building would have blocked her view. Lisa said that she spoke to Joanne at 7.30 a.m. on February 6, while police cars were at Helen's building. This was prior to the murder being reported. Later, Lisa changed her story, now saying that she spoke to Joanne on February 7, not February 6. She probably did this because Bert refreshed her memory. Helen's apartment was very small. How would six people fit in there and have enough room to commit a murder? This would be like committing homicide inside of a clown car. Also, why would six people, who were only loosely connected to one another, conspire to commit this type of murder? Was it some type of murder party where everyone was invited? It just doesn't make any sense. Item number two. The police manipulated the suspects in a few different ways. Bert turned off the video recordings two times. In both instances, the suspect came back with new memories. Wayne Price used the mythical concept of repressed memories to convince people they were guilty. The police used a polygraph to convince people who were telling the truth that they were lying. Several of the Beatrice Six had criminal records and were worried about their chances of winning in a trial. At least two of them had a mental health history. Wayne Price had contact with both of these people as a mental health clinician and yet questioned and manipulated them in his role as a police officer. Item number three, the police had many good reasons to suspect that Bruce Allen Smith was the killer. Bruce was seen walking toward Helen's apartment building right around the time of the murder. He had new scratches on his face after the murder. He was familiar with the apartment building. He had an extensive criminal history. Not long before the attack, he stated he was highly interested in sex. He attacked a woman at a party in a trailer. And a wallet from one of the women at the party was found half a block from where Bruce was dropped off. The police trusted in the lab to give them the correct results on the blood type. When they received the incorrect result, they became fixated on that. They excluded all of the other inculpatory evidence. They were no longer using logic. 
the police believed everything that they learned in their training, like repressed memories, polygraphs, and lab results. They did not question anything. Item number four, many residents in Beatrice, Nebraska, still believe that the six exonerated individuals were guilty and that Bert Searcy is a hero. It probably doesn't help that their property taxes went up because of the $28.1 million settlement. Some of those who believe the Beatrice Six are innocent still blame the five of them who falsely confessed. These people say that Bert was well-intentioned and they forgive him for putting six innocent people in prison for a total of 76 years. Item number five, Joseph White was the hero in this case. He was the only one that stood up for the truth. This includes law enforcement. His courage resulted in everybody being exonerated. Which brings me to the final item, number six. Why did the five members of the Beatrice Six confess? I think it was due to a combination of factors. For example, some of the suspects were not intelligent. Some had mental health issues. Some were worried about being executed or going to prison for life. As each person confessed, the remaining people were facing an increasingly difficult situation. Even though all these factors contributed to the false confessions, the most important factor was the incompetence of the police and the state lab. They did just about everything wrong in this case and somehow never faced any criminal charges and did not have to contribute to the financial settlement. Just like the actual killer in this case, the authorities escaped justice. This case stands as a reminder to view confessions with skepticism. Some people say that we shouldn't worry about false confessions because they are exceedingly rare. Yet here we see that two police officers who would not have been able to graduate from the Barney Fife School of Policing managed to manipulate five out of six people into falsely confessing. If these incompetent police officers could do this, anyone could. Those are my thoughts on the case of Helen Wilson and the Beatrice Six. Please put any opinions and thoughts in the comment section. They always generate an interesting dialogue. As always, I hope you found my analysis of this topic to be as intriguing as a homicidal clown car. Thanks for watching.